So I'm going to start out with a little something funny that I, I read, and I thought it was funny. Now, maybe you all have heard this. I don't know, but I thought it was funny. So I'm going to might get a little bit theatrical with you. <laughs> so an elderly lady was well known for her faith and, and her boldness in talking about it. She'd stand on her porch and she'd shout, praise the Lord. And next door to her lived an atheist. And he would get so angry at her proclamation, he'd look at her and he'd shout, there ain't no Lord. Well, hard times sat on the elderly lady and she prayed to God to send her some help. And she'd stand on the porch and she shouted, praise the Lord, God, I need food. I'm having a hard time. Please, Lord, send me some food. I'm having a hard time. Well, the next morning, the lady walked out onto her porch, and lo and behold, there was a large bag of groceries sitting there. And she shouted, praise the Lord. Well, along comes that atheist out of the bush, and he says, aha, I told you ain't no Lord. I bought those groceries. God didn't. And at that, the, old, the elder lady stood up, and she's jumping up and down, shaking her hand. She said, aha, praise the Lord. Not only did the Lord send me groceries, but he made the devil pay for them. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I don't know about y'all, but I think that's pretty good faith. <laughs> that's pretty good. That's boldness. You know, I don't know if I could stand out there and do all that. But <laughs> so I just think it'd be awesome if we all had some kind of faith like that, you know, the boldness to get out there and, and say it and not worry about what everybody else is going to think about you. You know, it's not up to what we think or what we do. It's up to what God tells us to do and whether we obey him or not. So how many of you ever found yourself doing something you never, ever in your lifetime thought you'd be doing. Well, that's what I'm doing right now. <laughs> I never thought I'd be standing in front of a group of people talking, okay? So God told me, he says, it's not about how I feel or what I think. It's about listening to what he tells me to do and just allowing him to take over. So that's what I'm fixing to do. So if y'all just bear with me. And then I got to think, you know, and the Lord was talking to me, and he says, you know, think about all the people who God used to weren't qualified, okay? He used Noah. Noah built an ark. And what happened? Noah got drunk, okay? So none of us are perfect. And he used Moses. He used Moses in Exodus. Um, now, in Exodus 16, 12, it says that he was a poor speaker. So, of course, you know, if you know the story, he complained to God, and he whined and said, you know, I'm not a good speaker. I can't do this. So God finally gave in and sent Aaron to help him out. But he still used Moses all along. And then the last example I have is in 1 Samuel 17 with David. You know, everybody thought David was too small. David wasn't going to do anything. He's this little runt guy, right? Well, he fought Goliath, and he won with the help of God, with God's there beside him with his faith. So you know if God can use people like that, he can use all of us. You know, we just have to let him. So when he told me to talk to you all about planting seeds of faith, I said, yeah. But did I have my reservations about doing it? Yeah, you better believe I did. I'm like, God, are you sure you want me doing this? I said, okay. So, first of all, what is faith and how much do we need? Well, I'm glad you all asked that question because I'm going to tell you. <laughs> from Hebrews 1.11 from the Amplified Bible, I use several different Bibles in my studies at home. It tells us that faith is the assurance of things we hope for, being the proof of things that we do not see, and the conviction of their reality. So in other words, faith assures us of things that we expect and convinces us of the existence of things that we do not see. <clears throat> me. Now Matthew 17 20 says that if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move and it'll move. So now if y'all just pick up your handout that I gave you, I don't know how many of you have ever seen a mustard seed. I never did until I went shopping. Those are really tiny. I mean, that's all the faith that we need is just the size of a mustard seed. And I also found a little interesting fact. I checked it out. And you can actually plant those seeds, and they'll actually grow. And they'll have little sprouts that you can use, like, on your salads and stuff. I thought that was pretty cool. I mean, I just got them out of the spice department at the store, you know. A little information there. <laughs> So the next time you find yourself saying that you don't have enough faith, just remember that you do have. It doesn't take a lot. You just have to rely on that faith and let God do the rest. Now, when I think of seeds, I think of everything that's involved, you know, the planting, the watering, the waiting for it to grow and taking care of it. And that's exactly how it is when we plant seeds of faith in someone's life. We plant that seed and we watch it grow and we water it. 
And it's introducing someone to God, you know, maybe for the first time. You don't know that they've ever even heard about God. And it's planting thoughts of who God is. So how do you plant seeds of faith? Well, it's really pretty simple. Oh, simple. Wait a minute. I came up with an anagram for that. For simple, it says, stay in my plans loving everyone. And I thought, you know, God's plans are pretty mighty, and he always knows the right way to do that. So we just need to stay in them and don't question them. So as Christians, I think, you know, we plant seeds more than what we realize. We do it without even knowing it. Like you walk up to someone and you say, you know, hey, God bless you. Or even when you go out to the restaurant to eat and if you're praying over your meal, you don't know who's watching you. You know, and they're like, wow, they have faith. They actually believe in God. They actually pray over their food. I think that's pretty cool. So um, how do we water our seeds? Well, this is where we have to speak and declare God's word over it. If you're planting seeds over somebody or to somebody and you just ask God, you know, just send down the rain and water those seeds and bless them and then leave the rest up to God and he'll take care of that. So when all of this first started, um, God showed me the, the scripture, 1 Corinthians 3, 6 through 8. And from the Amplified Bible, it says, Paul planted, Apollos watered, but God all the while was making it grow, and he gave the increase. So neither he who plants is anything nor he who waters, but only God who makes it grow and become greater. He who plants and he who waters are equal, yet each shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. So I found in my studies that there's three key principles when it comes to sowing faith. First of all, you recognize that God is the source. God, now God uses uh, many different ways to supply our needs. So don't limit God just because you think it's impossible. Because you remember in Matthew 19, 26, it tells us that with God, all things are possible. Yeah. Not what we think might be. Right. Second of all, give first. You cannot outgive God. I found that out myself. I mean, if you think you can't give, pray about it. You know, you might say, I can't afford to give. I don't have enough money. Well, that might just be Satan trying to steal your blessing. So I always pray about it first. And you got to remember, too, that giving isn't always financially. I mean, you can give of your time, of your love, and your prayers. I don't know about you all, but I, I am so touched when somebody says, let me pray for you. I mean, you're talking to my Heavenly Father for me. I think that's pretty amazing. And number three, expect a miracle. You know, the very moment we ask God for something, and the moment we do our part, yes, we have to do our part. We can't just ask God for something to sit back and say, okay, bring it on, bring it on. <laughs> but don't be disappointed if God's answer isn't what you're expecting. Because a lot of times it is. What we might think we want is not what we want and not what we need. But God knows best. <clears throat> so now I want to read a little script from James 1, 6 through 8. It says, but when you ask him, be sure that you really expect him to tell you. And this is out of the Life Application Bible. For a doubtful mind will be as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. And every decision that you make will be uncertain as you turn first this way, then that. So if you, if you don't ask with faith, don't expect the Lord to give you any solid answer. We have to believe what we're asking. We have to believe that God will do what he, what he says he will. Zechariah 4.10 from the Life Application Bible says, Do not despise a small beginning, for the eyes of the Lord rejoice to see the work begin. What you do for God may seem small and unimportant at the time, but God rejoices in what is right, not necessarily what's big. So just be faithful in the small opportunities. Begin where you are and do what you can and leave the rest to God. So no matter how small your faith may seem, keep planting those seeds. God will meet your needs and solve the problems that seem like unmovable mountains in your lives. You know, it's kind of like the song we sing, Do It Again, I've Seen You Move the Mountains. I've seen God move mountains in my life several times, and I'm sure y'all have. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he will do it for each and every one of us. All we have to do is keep the faith, keep planning, and keep trusting God. I started not feeling real good the, about the second week in November. I never get sick. I, it's, I was thinking about it. It's probably been 10 years since I called off work because I was sick and wouldn't be able to function. And I just started getting real tired, and my throat hurt. 
Well, I used to get a lot of sore throats when I was a kid, so I thought, oh, great. After all these years, I have strep throat again. So I didn't think too much of it. And um, I called off work, and my supervisor, I have a fantastic supervisor, she says, you need to go to the doctor. And I'm like, nah, I, I'm going to be good. I'll be good. I'll just gargle with the salt water and rest, and, and I'll be good. And she's like, I don't think so. Lisa over here, she kept telling me, you need to go to the doctor. I'm like, no, I'm fine. She goes, well, at least maybe get tested. I'm like, they're saying it's all respiratory. I said, I'm, I can breathe. I'm doing okay in that department. Well, it got to the point where I couldn't hardly function. So I uh, was talking to a couple of the girls at work, and they're like, our insurance covers, I don't know if it's still called Activate or not. They said, call over there and get an appointment there. So that's what I did. And this is how bad I felt. Most of you know that I don't go out of the house without my hair being done and my makeup being done. I went to the doctor that day in Ohio State lounger pants that I had to roll up twice, and they were still too long because they were Doug's. <laughs> and I just put on... Uh, some fur boots, and a navy blue shirt. Didn't even match the pants. I don't go anywhere if I don't match or coordinate. And I got to the place, and oh, and my glasses, not my contacts. That right there tells you I don't feel good. So I get there, and I'm like, I've never been here before. I'm not sure even where to go in. So I saw all these cars parked. I'm like, well, that must be where the employees park. So I went to the back parking lot. And I actually, I came in the back door. And I'm walking in there. And uh, I went in and checked in at the desk. And I sat down. And then somebody come around. I was just so tired. And somebody come around. And she's like, uh, talking to me, and I says, well, I have strep throat. Just give me something in my strep throat, and I'll be good, and I'll go home. Well, no, she goes, it's protocol to, you know, check for COVID and all that stuff. And I'm like, no, no, no. I just have strep throat. Pretty soon, there's a lot of activity around me. This lady comes back, and she goes, you got to go to the emergency room. And I'm like, what? And she goes, yeah, we're taking you to the emergency room. She goes, you got to go to the emergency room. So in my foggy brain, I'm thinking, I have to take myself to the emergency room. But they told me I can't drive. So I made a phone call, thinking I've got to get somebody here to take me to the emergency room. I don't remember making the phone call, but I called my cousin Paula. I saw her walk in. And um, I remember talking to her. And then she tells me that the, somebody came and took the phone away from me. And she's like, no, she's not going anywhere. She's going to the emergency room. And so they come in with a stretcher. And I'm like, what is going on? And they're like, we're taking you to the emergency room. And I'm like, no, just give me something for my strep throat and let me go home. And they're putting me on the stretcher. And I'm still arguing with them <laughs> that I do not have COVID. I have strep throat. Let me go home. And I don't remember getting in the rescue unit. I do not remember going to the emergency room. Next thing I know, I wake up, and Dr. Stuckey is standing there. He's an anesthesiologist at ProMedica. And he's talking to me, and my phone's blowing up. I got people texting me, and I'm trying to text, and people are calling me, and they're going, ask about this and ask about that. And I'm like, what is this? They're telling me that I need to ask for this medicine or that medicine. And so we got that all taken care of. And he goes, um, I got to give you something. Your oxygen levels are really low. And I'm like, okay. And I'm just kind of like, you know, it's like a whirlwind in my brain. And so he's like, I got to put something in your arm over here. And he goes, I'm going to warn you. He says, it's going to hurt. I'm like, okay. So he puts my arm on something and uh, it hurt. It hurt. I remember that. It hurt. And he gets all done, and he's like, I'm really sorry to have to tell you this. He goes, it's not working. i got to put it in your other arm. He goes, i got to do it all over again. I'm like, are you serious? He's like, yes, I am. I'm like, okay, then let's just get over here and get it done. That's the last thing I remember. 
the next thing I remember is waking up in what would end up being the third hospital I was in. Um, and this is where... Rachel tried to explain things to me so I could understand. But, oh, <laughs> thank you. It's easier to pull it out of this box. But they had me on the highest of the oxygens, and they had me on the highest dosages of everything they could give me. And from what I understand with Rachel, she would call about every day, and I would talk to her. And I remember none of it. And she said, I would tell her, nobody comes in to visit me. Why doesn't anybody come in to visit me? She says, Mom, you're in quarantine. She goes, nobody can. And she said, I told her, she said, I just kept insisting this about every day. If your dad was still here, he would find a way to get in here and see me. And she was like, Mom, no, he wouldn't. You're in quarantine. She goes, no, your dad would find a way. And, <clears throat> and she said that she would talk to doctors, and, and she had a group of people that she would call. And Jordan, my son, had people that they would call and keep try to keep people up on what was going on. She said at first they wasn't saying too much because they wasn't getting good reports. And um, she said uh, she, they were going to, oh, see, I can't remember what she said they were going to do. And so she said, I want to talk to her before you do this. Oh, intubate me. And she says, but I'm in Memphis because she's been doing some traveling nurse work. And she was in Memphis, Tennessee. And she goes, if I can get there, she goes, I want to talk to her before you do that. And they said, well, we'll wait as long as we can. And she said she got up to Kentucky, almost Ohio, and they called her. So we can't wait any longer. We have to do this. And she was like, all right. So she said, I just turned and went back home because they weren't going to let me see you anyway or back to Memphis. And... Um, I think she said I was on there for 14 days, intubated, and and um, they said that they were gonna. They called her and said they were gonna try to. They wanted to take take me off. She says no. She goes, I want to see her, and she goes, when's the quarantine up? And they they told her, and she says, that that she goes, I'm gonna come up, the day that I can go in and see her, and so Jordan and and Rachel come up together and. They told them who they were and who they wanted to see, and because they were going to leave one at a time. And so when Rachel said, she goes, well, I'm a nurse. And they were like, and they, they told them what was going on. They said, well, okay, you both can go in. So Rachel being Rachel, she came in and she was like, Ma, what are you doing causing all this trouble? And she said, I opened my eyes and looked right at her. And she said, I, she kept talking to me and I kept looking at her. So she said, you know, Jordan started talking to me on the other side, and, and she said, I told the doctor, her color's fine. She's doing good. She knows we're here. She goes, you guys aren't changing. They wanted to change my status. And she says, we're not changing anything. We're not changing anything. Um, and I then at one point, I was what they would do what was called blame me prone, which was be put them on my stomach. I guess that... Uh, helps the lungs. It doesn't make them work as hard. That's why I have, well, I put makeup on today to try to cover it, but I have scars on my face, and I have some scars down here on my mouth, and it's from all the, the tubes and, and whatnot that they had there. And I discovered yesterday that my nose curves now. So <laughs> maybe that'll come back. I don't know. 
But um, she said that really helped. And then I guess I was doing well, so they tried to turn me over, and everything started dropping again. So they put me back. And um, at one point, they can't explain it. The doctors can't explain it. But from one day to the next, all of a sudden, and Rachel gave me some explanations. And, and like I said, I can't remember all the stuff that she told me. But my numbers just started getting better and better and better. And I don't know. Then at one point, Rachel came. They, well, like I said, when she was here, um, when they started to take me off the oxygen, Jordan, was Rachel here? No, okay. So they must have been talking to her on the phone or something. But they decided that they needed to start weaning the oxygen because it was like the highest it'd go. And they said, we can't have her on this this long. We need to start lowering these numbers and taking this stuff down. But we don't know what's going to happen because some of the bronchial tubes the only thing I remember is from high school science, they told you to remember it because it looked like um, um, broccoli. But my, my bronchial tubes had started to crystallize. And they said when that happens, they, it doesn't return. And the breathing, she may be on, on oxygen um, forever. Um, I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit. When I was home, I had to go see the pulmonary doctor, and he had me take, go get a new x-rays of my lungs. My lungs are clear. Um, I forgot to ask the doctor, but I, but I talked to Rachel, and I says, Rachel, I forgot to ask him, because you hear so much about people having scars of legion, lesions, and she goes, did he tell you you have scars and lesions? And I says, no. She goes, well, then you don't. And... I did not come home with oxygen. I had very little oxygen. But anyway, go back, and I guess she said about up to Thanksgiving Day, then they needed to do something to help me along. Um, because I was, you know, she said it was just after Thanksgiving. Um, the quarantine ended the Monday after Thanksgiving, so she was up right after then, um, I had three drips of whatever maxed out on two of them. On Wednesday, must have been the Wednesday after Thanksgiving, they started turning the drips down. My lungs improved. At that point, Rachel had to go back home, and they did a surgery for the trach and the feed tube. Um, when things started getting better, I guess they kind of brought me out of the in the medically induced coma, I did tell somebody one time I had a chemical, chemically induced coma. Jordan looked at me and he's like, Mom, it's not a chemical induced coma. I said, what was it? He goes, medically. I'm like, okay. So I tried to remember to say medical and not chemical. But um, they put the feed tube in and the trach. And when I got to that third hospital called Regency, um, Pastor Tim came, you went to Flower Hospital, right? Once. And they were telling him that I was getting ready to go to Regency. And so he just said he kept walking around my room praying for me. Because basically we were, they were told that most people don't come out of that. They only have maybe, what'd you say, 2%? Two out of everybody they send. Yeah, okay. Two out of everybody they send actually comes out. And, um... So that's, that's where they send me. And so I, when, when they brought me out of that, and I, can, I remember talking to people, um, there was a lot that happened at that hospital, and I remember most of that. Um, I had the trach. I couldn't talk, which <laughs> we did. We played charades. And... Um, because they had to order a cannula because they'd sent the wrong size and they had to order another one so I could talk. So I don't know how long it was, a few days a week. I, I you know, we, we, and I, they, Jordan bought a whiteboard for me to write on. Well, I couldn't, I couldn't hold 
the marker to write. I kept dropping it. And so I was just like, forget this. And so I was in there, and they finally got the, the correct cannula. And, you know, this is during Christmas. Um, the last thing as far as holidays I remember is the Halloween parade. There was, there was, I was in a coma at Thanksgiving. And so we're coming up to Christmas. I'm a Hallmark fan. I love to watch all those Hallmark movies. I'll watch the same movie three, four, five times. And this one particular night, I was kind of having a rough night. And I don't even know it was afternoon, night, what. And somebody had turned the TV on and they put a Hallmark movie on. And it happened to be one with um, Kelly Pickler. She was from American Idol. And it was, it was uh, filmed at Graceland. That one was rough. All I could do was hear it. And it really reminded me of family and of dad and Doug because it talked about family traditions and some of them they named and some of them was some things that we did. And it reminded me of when I was a kid and the stuff we would do and I knew Christmas was coming. And then as I had my own family, things that we did with our kids and I finally got the nurse guy says, shut that off. I said, I can't, I can't take it anymore. And I didn't, tell, I didn't let him turn the TV on for like three days. And so then one day a nurse came in and she says, um, I'm going to pull the covers back and I'm going to ask you to do some stuff for me. I was like, okay. She goes, can you wiggle your toes for me? I looked at her and I'm like, yeah, I can wiggle my toes. She goes, well, go ahead and do it. I'm like, okay. And so she had me, she goes, can you move your ankles? I says, well, what do you want me to do? So I did this. I said, look, I can do this too. You know, and, and she was like, okay. And I pulled the covers back and I said, look, I can do this. She just kind of was frustrating me. And I was like bending my knees and I went to throw my leg off the side of the bed like I was going to sit up. She goes, no, 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 don't do that. We don't want you to get up yet. And she put my covers back and she went out and then she came back in. I'm like, what was all that about? She goes, you're not supposed to be able to do any of that. She says, not yet anyway. She goes, because we haven't worked with you yet. I said, well, I've been moving my legs since I got here. And she was like, oh. So then the, the um, visitation at this place was rather strict. You could only come certain hours a day and I could only have so many visitors per day. And Jordan and Kristen were, after working all day, they would come and visit at least twice a week, if not more. One day they brought me a, a present, a gift. It was a Christmas gift bag. And he goes, this is from Janet and Paula and the families. I'm like, oh. So they started pulling stuff out. They pulled out this beautiful blanket. It was white. It was soft. And it was just like, oh, my gosh. And Jordan said, they brought it to the house last night, Mom, and they anointed it with oil, and we prayed over it. He says, Mom, it was awesome. He said, you could just feel. He said, I could have stood there all night and listened to them take turns and pray. And it was just because the presence of God was so strong. And I don't have sisters but I've got women in this church and in my family that fill that spot for me. And, and the family that I'm from, I know Pastor teases about how many of us there are, but um, they're just, it's incredible, you know, because I know I have at the end of my phone on both sides of my family, my mom's side and my dad's, the people I can call, and they've been there for me. And, and so this blanket kind of took on a life of its own. We called Janet, and I wanted to thank her for the blanket. I said, but you know, it's white. I think I'm going to send it back home because I don't want it to get dirty. And she was like, oh, well, okay. And I knew right then and there that I needed to keep that blanket with me. And so I kept it, and when the nurses would come in, because it was so soft, I would have them put it on me first, because it felt good. And then after a while, I thought, no, 
this blanket needs to be seen. And as the nurses would come and go and the people would come and go, they would always straighten my blankets, forever straightening my blankets. And they would touch the, the blanket that they had prayed on. And I know that there was nothing special about the blanket, but that anointing had been put on that, and it carried, it was that point of contact where they had prayed on that. So I started having the nurses put that on top. And when, especially when the nurses that would come in at night, they would feel that blanket, and they were like, oh, that's not one of ours. And I'm like, no, this was a gift. I said, let me tell you about my blanket. And they were like, okay. And I'm like, the blanket itself has no special powers. I says, but people prayed over that blanket. And I says, I'm getting better because of the God's healing power. And I've never really been one to, to do things like that. But I figured, you know what? They opened the door, and I was going to walk through it. And I don't know how many different nurses and aides came in, and they would go, oh, that blanket feels good. Let me tell you about my blanket. And I got to share. And I got a few, oh, okay. But it would start a conversation, because quite a few of the people had some form of a faith. And then one night, when a, a nurse came in, and I told her about my blanket. She goes, oh, my gosh, yes. She goes, God said, and she started, like, preaching to me. And I looked at her, and I'm like, you're a born-again believer, aren't you? She goes, oh, yeah. And she was a traveling nurse. Her name was Hannah. And Hannah and I developed a really neat relationship. She would make me her last patient of the night so then we could talk. And she would tell me she was just she was young, it was her just her and her husband, and they had some things in their heart that they wanted to do as a ministry. And the night before I left, I just really felt God was giving me something for Hannah. So when she came in, I said, "No, Hannah, when you come in tomorrow night, I'm not going to be here." I said, "They're sending me to the rehab hospital." She's like, "Yeah, I know, I heard." I says, "But I think God wants me to tell you this," and so I told her what I felt God wanted me to tell her. And she just started crying. She's like, oh my gosh, she goes, that really confirms what we want to do and what we feel, where we feel God is leading us. And so then I get to the rehab center. And this is where, uh, well, I forgot to tell you about the first time they had me stand up. That was back at the Regency Hospital. And I thought we were going to go through the window. Where they stood me up, and I just, like, kept going. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, my legs felt like they were on fire. And I'm like, and I told the one physical therapist, I got to sit down. I got to sit down. It hurts. Too bad it hurts. So we sat down, and she's like, you did really good. I looked at her, and I'm like, did really good? I said, I stood up about, took you guys through the window with me, and we sat back down. She goes, no. She goes, you stood for over 10 seconds. And I looked at her. She goes, most people can barely do one. She said, some people barely get up off the bed, and they have to sit down. She said, you did really well. So then I get to the rehab center, and I have a whole new group of nurses and aides to tell about my blanket. <laughs> and a couple of times at night when I was having trouble sleeping, I would play on my phone. I have a Pandora app, and I would play worship music. And... They would come in, and they would either feel the blanket or hear the music. And it's like, let me tell you about my blanket. And most of them were very receptive, very responsive. Um, I did get one nurse. I only had her one time. I never saw her again. But she came in, and we started talking. And, and she's like, oh, yeah, you know, I pray over people. And I'm like, no, oh, awesome. And we were talking, and she goes, and so what kind of crystals do you use? <laughs> and I went, oh, <laughs> I thought, I don't know anything about crystals, God, you know. And I said, well, we really don't do that. And she's like, oh, I have crystals with me all the time. And I did notice she had quite a few bracelets on both hands. But um, what I think is, is just really neat is all the people that I just told them about my blanket. And while I may have been putting seeds in their lives, you know, even though I was raised in the church and, and all this stuff, you guys were also ministering to me. Um, I would get cards in the mail. And one of my last days at the Regency Hospital, the 
reception son come running in. She goes, don't leave yet. Don't leave yet. Leave yet. She goes, you've got um, a man. She gave me a stack of, of envelopes. She goes, today, over half the mail was just for you. And I said, oh, I said, I got a lot of people that, that are encouraging me right along. And she goes, and in fact, while you've been here, most of the mail's been for you. And I says, doesn't anybody else get mail? She goes, no. She goes, no. Most of the people here, no, they don't. And I had people, when they heard, started hearing that I was going to leave and go to the rehab center, the therapist came in, and they gave me hugs, and they're like, we're going to miss you. I'm like, well, thank you. And, and different people, different nurses were coming in. And the one nurse, and she's like sitting there, and she's like, this never happens. She goes, I've never seen a patient where the people were coming in telling them bye. We're going to miss you. We've enjoyed having you here, even though in the manner of which you were here. And I was like, oh, okay, thank you. And so, you know, you might not always realize with what you say, or just sometimes in what you do, you know, like I said, this is where it's wrapping into what Shirley was saying. So then I get to the rehab center, and like I said, this gal's talking about the crystals, and and I, but I never saw her again. But I had other nurses and aides and different people, and when I when they first started me on the the therapy, where I had to go down to the therapy room, they put you through to see what you can do. And when I got all done, they're like, well, I'm not sure what's gonna happen. And I'm like, why? And they're like, well, we had a whole program set up for you to follow, and they're like, you're already doing what's at the end. And I'm like, okay, can I just go home then? And they're like, no, no, no. And so we have to do a whole new program. So we got through that, and you know, people would come and go, and you kind of develop a little bit of relationships with these people and different ones kind of you connect with them and and when I got ready to go my goal was I wanted to walk out of that place because they asked me they said what's your goal I said when I leave here I'm walking out well I forgot it was still considered a hospital you still have to go out in a wheelchair so the nurse that was wheeling me out was a male nurse and um Jordan and Kristen came to pick me up in the suburban. Yeah, I'm five foot four. I struggled to get in the suburban the regular. So the, the guy's pushing me out, and I'm like, okay, we're in this foyer here. Technically, we're not in the hospital. Let me get up and walk. He's like, it's a like glass windows. He goes, they'll see me. He goes, I can't let you get up and walk out of here. I'm like, I want to walk out of here. And he's like, no. So they get me to the Suburban. And they put the wheelchair up in there. And Eric, that was the name of the nurse, he's like, okay, we'll help you up. And I'm like, no. Uh -uh. I said, if I can't walk out, I'm getting in the Suburban by myself. I said, my goal was to walk out in my cute boots and get in the, you know. Walk. But I forgot to tell him to bring my cute boots. So I had my furry boots. And I said, we're going to put the wheelchair up here. We're going to lock this wheel. We're going to lock this wheel. You guys stay here in case I do slip. But I got up in that suburban by myself. And when I got up and was settled, I looked at that nurse. And he's like, I didn't think you could do that. And so then um, Rachel knew, could tell me all about the beginning, and she was amazing for me. And then I thought, well, when I go home, I'm just going to go home, you know. And Jordan was like, no, Mom, you're going to come stay with us. So I ended up staying with Jordan for five weeks, I think it was. Um, I'm going to brag on this one for a little bit. They were amazing. Colbin gave up his bedroom for me. He slept on an air mattress for five weeks. Bentley, they, the home health care nurses started coming to the house. And once again, the plan they had for me, I could do everything. So they had to redo that plan. And I was telling these people how God was just healing me. This was, yeah, you know, because the doctors, they did everything they could do. They were telling my kids that I was probably going to be on oxygen for the rest of my life. Well, at the rehab center, I did get an infection, and they put, first thing they did was slap that oxygen on me. 
I kept, every time they'd leave the room, I'd take it out. And then come back in, they're like, you put that in your nose. No, I don't like it. I ended up being on just one liter of oxygen, and I came home with no oxygen. So then when I had to do my exercises, they have those stretchy bands. I'd have Bentley. Bentley, come and help Grandma with her, with her exercises. And, and after working all day, Kristen had come home, and I tell you, this girl has a talent for putting a meal together in like 20 minutes. And, you know, Jordan was there, what do you need, Mom? You know, he'd, he'd run and get medicine for me. And, and then once I, I did go home, um, I was doing some physical therapy. Shirley was my driver. And she would come and pick me up. And she'd say, do you need help? And I'm like, no, I want to do this. And I, I'm still working on some things. Um... I'm about the middle of summer, I'll start some speech there because I still struggle with some stuff with talking. But I look back on things now, and yes, it's frustrating on things that I don't remember. But what was so very important, and I really didn't mean to save this for this late in, in my story, but I had people from Boston, Massachusetts to People, my brother lives in Texas, and I have a brother in Georgia, and they had their prayer groups praying for me. There was several churches and people like Southern Ohio praying for me. Um, Kristen has family that lives in Redding, California, and their prayer groups and their church was praying for me. So I literally had people from almost like one end of the, the United States to the other praying for me. And to know that all those people, even if it's just five minutes a day, that took the time to pray for somebody, some of them didn't even know. And as, as I may have been planting seeds and doing stuff in the hospital, you guys were ministering to me. And because there was some dark days, you know, that mentally I'm like, you know, you're stuck in this hospital. I'm a people person. I like big groups, and you're in this hospital by yourself. And when I was at the rehab center, they kept wanting to shut the door. Talk about feeling cut off from the world. I'm like, no, leave my door open. And it's just, it's just been amazing. And the people at work, you know, they would send me cards. And, and you know, I talked, said something earlier about my supervisor, the company changed insurance at the first of the year. I'm in the hospital. I missed all the meetings. I didn't really know what was going on. My supervisor drove to Toledo so I could sign my papers so there would not be a glitch in my insurances as they switched. How many supervisors are going to do that? You know, and she was just amazing. And she made sure everything was set for me. And... Um, it's just been amazing how God has worked in my life. Um, I'm having more and more better days. Um, I've made comments like, I have a lot of intentions. I have a lot of good intentions. Well, I'm trying to act on those good intentions, just not let them be good intentions. And so I'm, I'm working on that. And it's just been amazing to see how God has worked in my life. Even with Rachel living where she does, and Jordan's in that part of his life where he's got teenagers. Y'all know how busy you get when you got teenagers. But yet, if I need something, I'll call him up. And if he can't do it right then, he'll go, okay, Mom, I can't do it now, but we'll do it this, or, you know, Kristen will help. Or, you know, and it's just been... You know, or, and mom will even call up and she'll say, well, so-and-so stopped by the day and, and we talked. You know, they wanted to know how you were doing. And, and you know, so she'll, she would call me up and, and ask things. And it, it's just, would I, would I want to go through this again? Would I wish a son I bet? No. When they took that feeding tube out, they just literally had to pull it out. And it was extremely, excruciatingly painful. I have given birth twice. 
and I had gallbladder surgery when they made an incision. And I have never felt pain like that in, like when, they, when they pulled that out. Shirley took me, she goes, I think I heard you holler. I said, you probably did, because it hurt. And it's just for the grace of God, because basically my kids were told that they might be, that to prepare themselves before my numbers start turning, to prepare themselves because they were most likely going to be planning a funeral. And Rachel told me that, you know, she's got little ones. They had grown. She goes, Mom, I found myself at a child's clothing store looking for clothes, funeral clothes for my kids. She goes, they're hanging in the closet and they're going back to the store. She goes, I'm not even going to keep them in the house. She goes, they're going back. You know, so I just kind of wanted to share what I went through and say thank you to everybody in this room because I know at one point everybody in this room has prayed for me, sent cards. If I'm having a bad day, I've got the cards all in one box. And I'll get them out and reread them because the majority of people wrote something in them. And, oh, and then of all things, of all things, my birthday was back in February. <laughs> And I turned 60. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like the brain does not compute. And uh, I had an amazing birthday party. And my daughter surprised me. She drove up from Memphis. And she got to spend the night. Um, but one of the worst things that had, I feel it's a bad thing, that happened to be about two weeks after I got to the house, I had showered and I started brushing my hair and I'm like, what in the world? The brush was literally full of hair. I had to pull the hair out before I could brush it again. And I'm like, Kristen, what's going on? And you know, she kind of would help me. And I mean, I lost, as you can see, about three fourths of my hair, which was very devastating for me. And I had to go in and the gal that does my hair cut six inches off. But my hair's coming back. And about a month ago, I was literally crawling in bed. And I was whining. And it's like, God, you know, all this stuff has happened to me. And then of all things, I'm losing my hair. And I'm just like, so then I get in bed and I lay down. And I'm like, I'm sorry, God. Please forgive me for complaining. You know, at least I'm here. I'm getting healthy. And that was a Saturday night. <laughs> Next Sunday, Julie Sufel would sit over here, and during praise and worship, she'd come up to me, and she goes, I'm not sure about this, but she goes, I think that God wants me to tell you something. I'm like, okay. And she says, he wants to tell me that it's going to be okay, that your hair's going to come back, <laughs> and it's going to be better than it ever was. And I looked at her, and I'm like kind of crying and laughing at the same time. And she's looking at me like, what the heck? She had no idea what I had said before. But yes, my hair's coming back. Underneath, it's like a little puff ball. And, and um, I'm just trying to have a really good attitude about things. Um, God has been in my finances. I did get a bill in the mail yesterday. But other than that bill... All my medical bills are paid. I mean, I was in the hospital from November 11th to January 4th. And I was on medications, and I was on this and on that, and they're doing this and doing that. And God has just been so faithful. And I just want to thank you all for standing there with me because there has been moments that without Doug being here, I have felt very alone. And... Like I said, Lisa gets those phone calls. And she's just so gracious with it. And I just want to thank you all for everything that you've done for me. And I hope I've encouraged somebody that even though the day may look dark, there is light at the end of the tunnel, and God is always, always there. Amen. Stay right there. Stay right there. Oh. So again... We like to pray over people. This is your chance for your seed. Stretch your hands out this way.
Lord God, just continue. We thank you for how far you've brought Beth and how far you're going to bring Beth and how much you're going to show your goodness in all the seeds that she planted and in the seeds that we're planting right now by praying for her. And this we thank you for in Jesus' name. Amen.